For more interviews on educational technology and for a list of our technology workshops, please visit www.edtechlive.com. To join the discussion on School 2.0, please visit www.school20.net. I think that the amazing moment we have right now in time is to kind of go back and rethink what Dewey really was about. I think we have to reinvent Dewey for the 21st century, finding a way to bring productive inquiry, bring the social basis of learning, bring the cognitive basis of learning all together. And I think now we can actually start to do that in a much more authentic way for kids at almost any age in a way that there's truly authentic things that these kids are doing that are being picked up by other kids and shared and built on and so on and so forth. I study amateur uh, astronomy groups and how these kids are out there working together, hooking their telescopes sometimes all over the world together by the Internet and being able to now engage in pretty serious discovery of stuff serious enough that they're beginning to interact with the professional astronomers and a new kind of relationships being built between the, the professionals and the amateurs that both are learning from each other. That's a major step toward creating what I'm going to call a culture of learning. So what I find so critical about the kinds of things we're talking about in terms of participatory architectures for learning is they start at seven, eight years old or younger but it can build a momentum that extends through life that I think actually will be the real basis of economic capability of this country in the 21st century. Hi, this is Steve Hargadon, and it's Monday, January 15th, 2007. And my guest today is John Seeley Brown. Hi, John. Hi, how are you? I'm fine. John, thanks for taking this call. I, I know you're sitting on the beach in Hawaii enjoying some vacation. I really appreciate that you would take time to do this. Well, my pleasure. John, would you um, give us a little bit of a background about yourself as it relates to education technology for those who may not know who you are? Well, sure, very briefly. Um, you know, I mean, first of all, I was the uh, you know, former director of Xerox Palo Research Center for one and a half or two decades. Um, and, you know, at Park, behind the scenes, we were always engaged in pushing technology to the extremes, often having to do with ways that we, as both kids and adults, want to engage in continuous learning. Before coming to Xerox Park, I uh, was part of the intelligent tutoring uh, movement using very sophisticated AI machines to build training systems and to some extent also bringing in some of those ideas into education for math education and so on and so forth. Um, so on one hand, I started out very much hardcore, high-tech uh, toward education and have moved progressively more toward thinking about learning, not education, and likewise thinking not so much about structuring content, but structuring the context for learning um, and seeing how it is that people actually are inveterate learners when put in social groups and how almost all of the real learning we do today actually are things that we've learned from and with each other. And so I've always been kind of struck by the fact that there is quite a bridge between, if you wish, education on the one hand, the pouring of content into kids' heads, building up stocks of knowledge, versus looking at how do you participate in social flows, uh, flows of action from which you can also almost always pick up new ideas if you're willing to listen and reflect, especially reflect in practice. Do you feel that the, these things that you've learned about education are not uh, widely understood in, in traditional education? Well, I think the social basis of learning is not understood at all. In fact, if you look at today's educational systems, um, what I call learning with and from each other in terms of collaborative learning often goes under the guise of cheating. Uh, the whole notion of sitting there passively and receiving information has almost nothing to do with how do you actually internalize information into something that makes sense to you. So 
So I think that um, you know, I, I'm fond of saying that the learning starts as you leave the classroom when you start discussing with people and you as just said. And it is in conversation that you actually start to internalize what some piece of information means to you. So I think that there's a very strong basis <coughs> of social learning that has to go on. In fact, I think one of the most resu uh, robust results in educational theory, quote unquote, um, is that the, one of the best indicators of success, for example, in college, is if you know how to form and join study groups. Because in the study group, again, you start to converse. You start to play with ideas. You start to work out problems collaboratively. So you socially engage with others. So I, I'm fond of saying that the huge shift that I've been kind of sponsoring myself and my own thinking for now 30 years is kind of the shift from a Cartesian point of view of I think, therefore I am, where knowledge is a kind of substance that gets kind of poured into your head to build up stocks of knowledge in your head, uh, supposedly, versus we participate, therefore we are. And it is in participation with other that we come into being, and that could be a psychoanalytically true, but it is also in participation with other that we start to internalize our own understandings of the world and learn. How involved are these thoughts with the current technologies associated that people call the Read Write Web or Web 2.0? Well, you know, I'm fond of thinking of Web 2.0 as being the beginning of a participatory architecture, as Tim, you know, laid out originally. Uh, and from everything I've just said, you see that to me, learning comes about through participation. Now, I'm also one who believes that that learning often comes from playing with ideas or trying to build things and then when things don't quite work out or for example designing a game you know, that kind of an example you um, actually then start to engage in what Dewey would call productive inquiry so I think a key aspect of this participatory notion is not just the social basis of conversing with each other but also trying to do something with what you have at your disposal and when you fail to achieve what you want, then you start to dig deeper. So you engage in, kind of a in, you engage in kind of a productive inquiry in terms of an intelligent search for the answer, for ideas about how to remove the barriers that you're currently finding. Now, the amazing thing about the web today is that anytime I get stuck on virtually anything, what do you do? You go to the web. And you try to find who else has experienced that, what do they think, what are the hints that you can find, and so on and so forth. I don't think we kind of understand just how profound Google has changed the context of how we work day in and day out, and our willingness now to engage in trying things that we don't know how to do completely, because we have this tremendous resource to fall back on. So that just becomes another complement of, of uh, the kind of the tools that we now have to engage through action or to learn through action. Um, and I think that we're moving now from much more passive to much more active to people that are willing to go out on the edge more to try things we don't already know and then to do this both socially but also engage in productive inquiry when need be, which basically is always. So it sounds like many of the ideas uh, of School 2.0 actually predate Web 2.0, but that there's something about the easy ability to use these tools in uh, participatory ways that is in creating or engaging a dialogue about the nature of, of education. Yeah, absolutely. Is, is there such a thing as School 2.0? Can you actually create from the top down a systemic change, or will this just occur increasingly at the fringes and, and become more and more pervasive by virtue of people succeeding with it? You know, I guess there are two kinds of responses to this. Um, the first is that, at least where I come from, <coughs> I always think about developing the edge and letting the edge transform the core. And so I think that a lot of the things we're talking about here 
or how might we use after school programs or home learning or things that you do outside of the school that turn out to turn kids on completely. And then seeing kids kind of just totally engage with learning starts to send messages either through the parents and PTA meetings or teachers in school to say, well, how come Johnny is so turned on uh, to learn all these new things except when he walks in the classroom and then he turns off? And so I think that there are kind of opportunities to expect the edge to slowly transform the core. Now, having said this, let me step back a moment and let me clear my throat a second. <coughs> I kind of recognize that if you looked at the broader context, like when I grew up, or you grew up, um, <coughs> basically there were three pillars to the platform of education. One pillar was the schools. The second pillar was the community. And the community often took the form of a community library made possible by Andrew Carnegie almost 100 years ago that transformed how learning happened across the United States. And the third pillar is the family um, in terms of kind of discussions you have over dinner. Well, in a very interesting way, um, you know, Robert Putnam um, pointed out that we now moved into an era of bowling alone to the whole role of the community has been diminished as a source of learning, classical learning. Um, and I would say we've moved from bowling alone to dining alone, which means the role of the family has become less prominent as a source of a place to try out ideas, to argue your way, to argue your position, and so on and so forth. So two out of the three pillars that educated at least me, and I'm sure you, have disappeared. And now we're expecting the school system to do everything. Well, what's wrong with this notion? Um, you know, I don't think we've kind of begun to recognize what we're now asking the school system to do versus what we had to do you know, um, 20 or 30 or 40 years ago or more. Um, so I think what we're now beginning to see is we're starting to build new types of pillars. Now we're going back to building a new kind of community pillar. And these community pillars, I think, are going to be in the form of um, things you see with the web in terms of the social basis of learning, in terms of your own groups that you form together, your communities of, you know, of learners, um, and perhaps even the role of kind of amateur science that I've talked about a lot in terms of things like the pro-amateur astronomy groups and so on and so forth. I think we're going to see in the next like five to ten years a rethinking of what the role of a community library could be that could become a site for building, for kids to go as a social safe space to engage in exploring and building whatever they want to build. Um, and when they need to engage in productive inquiry, lo and behold, the reference librarian could turn in to become the mentor for how do you intelligently navigate and decide on what you want to believe and what you find on the web. So there may be kind of a slowly morphing of the community library as a different kind of a learning institution. And I also think we're beginning to find with homes now, internet connected almost everywhere, that, you, that the home itself is becoming a different kind of site for informal learning. I study a lot um, World of Warcraft, as you may or may not know. Very interesting to look at two and three generational families getting together in a guild in the World of Warcraft, grandparent, parent, and child. A whole new kind of intergeneral, intergenerational learning is starting to develop in some of these guilds. I listened to your story about the young man who had become some kind of a master in World of Warcraft. I can't remember right. what the term was. And uh, then was highly successful uh, as a football player and was being recruited by uh, pretty significant companies. And I had to stop and ask myself, um, why did I not immediately embrace that? Right. You know, I, 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 <laughs> I, I bet there are a lot. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> well, I, so I so I began to think, what are my you know what kind of fears do we have? I remember when I was in college, my dad came to visit me, and ATMs had just come out, and he was shocked to find that I did not carry cash with me. 
and I think he was afraid that I would be in a situation where I needed cash and didn't have. And he was just he could not understand that I would not keep cash in my wallet. But I had become accustomed to using an ATM. So we, I think we look at these new technologies, and I think some, there are some fears that come up. That, you know, is is playing a game? Can that actually be constructive? You know, um, what what kinds of things do you think stop us from embracing something like World of Warcraft? Well, I think that you know. First of all, um, we we confuse looking at the center of the game from looking at the edge and the periphery of the game. And let me be very clear here. Uh, that paper uh, that you're referring to, uh, I talked about uh, this guy Stephen as a guild master in the world of Warcraft, was talking about what he was learning along around the edge, the social life on the edge of that game. And that's to say that what he was learning was how to really build and run an amazing guild in terms of the ability to attract, to attract people, to retain people, to train people, to create strategies, to create a set of values that members of his guild really wanted to adhere to, and so on and so forth. So in a funny sort of way, um, that particular story, a lot of people do begin to get pretty quickly because they say, ah, isn't this the essence of kind of a leadership? And this has to do with the social life around the edge of that game. Um, now, the game creates the focus for these skills to be pulled together. Now, I'm going to argue even more, but that first paper did not, that actually playing the game as opposed to managing and, uh, and creating the guild is also a very interesting learning event. But again, the learning here in the World of Warcraft is indirect. It has to do with, for example, how are you willing to set out to achieve a quest and expect to kind of find the resources required if you are really clever, if you are situationally aware, if you have a set of people with you who can really function as a team and can back up each other, then you can solve the quest. And so you're learning some very interesting dispositional skills in terms of how to be situationally aware and to look for resources and to be able to think out of the box and think quickly. Um, so these are very interesting environments for some incredibly important skills to master in today's rapidly changing world. So if I'm a teacher or a parent and I, and I hear that description from you, I, I, I've used this uh, visual before, but I sort of feel like I'm in a barrel going over Niagara Falls. And I, I don't really know what to look at and say, oh, that's productive or that's not. You know, How do we begin to assess the, these, these types of activities? And, and how do we even begin to think about bringing them into a classroom environment? Well, first of all, I'm not sure that some of these things I just described need to be brought into a classroom environment. I think these have a lot to do <coughs> with things that happen outside the school that actually help to provide a kind of socialization or dispositional stance toward how you look at the world. And I think that a disposition on how you find resources, how do you expect to be responsible for finding resources, how do you engage in productive inquiry, and so on and so forth, are the dispositions that are critical for the 21st century. Now, you don't teach a disposition. You enable a disposition to be formed, so to speak, or you encourage and nurture a disposition to form. That's separate from actually learning about hardcore content. Now, one of the interesting questions is, is the learning of content as important as it used to be? Or is what's really important is expecting that you will be able to find content when you need it, but then need to be able to engage in not just productive inquiry, but kind of critical thinking. Now, that may be kind of the real purpose of the school, but in that case, what you want to do is probably rethink the school in terms of this whole sense of the inquiry method built around projects where the teacher actually is there is the one who is kind of being kind of the critical coach, so to speak. They say, well, does that idea really make sense? 
or trying to get kids to defend what they're trying to say or defend the positions that they actually hold. So, you know, we may be moving more again from just content to thinking processes that then stay with you for a long period of time. Do you find that people um, don't really know how to take the next step? I mean, um, what you've described is encouraging to me in terms of um, my own children. But then I wonder, how do I begin to use that constructively to help them? Well, I think, you know, what you're doing with your kids is providing kind of the backdrop for kids, for your kids to be able to ask questions, to be able to argue out positions, to be able to defend their position, and for you to be able to critically listen to them and get them excited about going deeper if need be to get to a kind of a, a more sound type of analysis. Now, you know, the, the irony of some of this is if kids get more engaged with designing and building things, then the, just the pursuit of making this thing work actually does start to teach a certain kind of, of not only productive inquiry, but kind of critical thinking. I mean, the incredibly wonderful thing about open source is that truth is determined by the execution of the code. You don't need kind of an arbitrator of truth in terms of a scholar. What you really want to do is to see, does this sucker work or not? Um, and so you kind of have a truth checker just built around you because you're trying to see, does this thing work like I want it to work? Um, or does it work at all? And so there's something very nice about being able to close that loop. And that's what kind of drives you deeper and deeper and deeper to kind of figure out kind of what is the algorithm? What are the problems with the algorithm? Why do I believe it actually does work? Which I really do want to believe if I want to submit it to an open source community because I surely don't want somebody else in my community to say it's a pile of junk. So you find kind of social pressures or kind of, again, going back to a social basis of learning, learning in order to join that particular community of practice is one of the biggest reasons why we learn today. I think Doc Searles made the point that uh, the, the youth who gravitate toward participating in open source software at a young age are learn an incredible amount about um, their own interests in accomplishing things through that participation. And we've talked in this interview series about the difference between open source software in education, the use of open source programs in schooling, and open source software as education. Have you seen any examples of formalized learning environments where the participatory nature of open source software or something like that ha has been implemented well? No, but that truly does not mean it hasn't. I mean, I'm not that engaged in a lot of the K through 12 type school systems uh, in this country, especially. I, I actually probably know more about Singapore than I do the United States right now. But, um, but I think that going back to what Doc Searle is getting at, you know, I would draw a distinction between learning about something and learning to be. And you learn to be through the kind of engagement of building something and entering a particular community of practice. And one of the interesting things about you know uh, doing open source is you do open source in a particular community. And, and each of these communities has slightly different aesthetics. So you actually start to enculturate into a practice. And in that in process of enculturating into a practice, you are learning to become in that practice. And so the aesthetics that you are picking up, often subconsciously, which is the aesthetics of that particular community of practice. And, and you know, in different open source communities, there's slightly different types of aesthetics. But the sense of thinking about learning through enculturation, and in that in process of enculturation, you're learning to be, I think is a critical notion. Because I think what we're now beginning to do is to look at building learning environments that kids learn to be now much sooner than, than in the past. 
You know, like I've been through, I hate to tell you how many years of education, but it wasn't until about my second year in graduate school that I began to learn what does it actually mean to be a research mathematician. And it's kind of like you keep learning about something. But it's not usually until your second or third year graduate school that you are shifted to, ironically, almost an apprenticeship model. When you start to apprentice with a master, the professor you're going to get your degree under, and start to kind of learn how to enculturate into his particular practice, his or her particular practice, as a learning to be a research mathematician. I think what we're finding is now we're finding ways to shift just learning about into learning to be much, much, much earlier. And I say much, much, much earlier because I think your learning to be is starting to happen now for youngsters in terms of these participatory learning platforms uh, that you know we might call the Web 2.0 point of view, where you engage in doing things. You engage in building photographs, in building movies, in building code, in building stories, in building games, in building guilds, and so on. Um, and that sense of engagement in, I think, is critical. So, you know, from my perspective, and I, I haven't seen the paper on Education 2.0, but I can kind of intuit what it has to be about. I think that the amazing moment we have right now in time is to kind of go back and rethink what Dewey really was about. I think we have to reinvent Dewey for the 21st century, finding a way to bring productive inquiry, bring the social basis of learning, bring the cognitive basis of learning all together. And I think now we can actually start to do that in a much more authentic way for kids at almost any age in a way that there's truly authentic things that these kids are doing that are being picked up by other kids and shared and built on and so on and so forth. In the past, when I was told in the early Dewey approach, go out and build a cabin. You know, that was an artificial task. It wasn't going to be picked up and used by other kids. And I think now what we have is, is a kind of a social dynamic where I begin to think about becoming through the process of building something that then gets shared, picked up, and then extended by somebody else. By the way, this can be something as simple as a little house or a piece of clothing in Second Life that I have designed and somebody else wants and I can give it to them or they can buy it from me and then they further mod it. So we're going, you know, we're creating worlds now and where we can create and mod, create, share, and mod, create, share, and mod. And in some interesting way, my persona starts to go with those things that I build, share, and other people build on. And you begin to look at the range of things that are happening, you know, um, starting with music, if you wish, and kind of the remix culture of building all the way up to the coding through then, you know, movies, um, then all the way into amateur or, or citizen science um, and, you know, As you know, I study amateur uh, astronomy groups and how these kids are out there working together, hooking their telescopes sometimes all over the world together by the Internet. Um, and being able to now engage in pretty serious discovery of stuff. Serious enough that they're beginning to interact with the professional astronomers and a new kind of relationships being built between the, the professionals and the amateurs that both are learning from each other. That's a major step toward creating what I'm going to call a culture of learning. And that kind of culture of learning goes on long after school as well. So what I find so critical about the kinds of things we're talking about in terms of participatory architectures for learning is they start at seven, eight years old or younger, but it can build a momentum that extends through life that I think actually will be the real basis of economic capability of this country in the 21st century. People have compared the advent of the read-write web to 
the printing press. And and certainly it does seem like these the changes that we're watching are a huge proportion. Can you describe uh, the studio environment that you, that you've discussed in a couple of places, the learning environment that you I, I don't know if you call it the studio, but I've seen it. Yeah, I do call it the studio-based learning. Uh, you know, and that's, of course, I have two prototypes that I think of as the basis, kind of set the foundation for learning. One is studio, and one is hacking in one form or another. <laughs> you know, in terms of the studio-based, like how architects learn, I spent all too much time in architectural studios in my life. Uh, my wife's an architect. Um uh, you know, is that it basically in the studio, especially at the school level, you know, uh, at the training, you know, professional architects, but also later on in the workplace, all work in progress is always rendered public. Now, what does this mean? This means that in an architectural studio, for example, at MIT, um, you know, you will find 12 to 20 architectural students all working on design projects. They're all working on them shoulder to shoulder. They're all kind of looking over each other's shoulder all the time, understanding the struggles that each student is going through, the kind of the processes of thinking and designing they're going through in order to kind of finally construct their end design, their end product, so to speak. Now what happens is that at different times during the year, the master comes in. Um, and would do a particular crit on a particular student's project. Um, all the other students overhear that. But that particular crit is an amazing learning moment for all the students, not just the student whose project is being crit. Because basically each student in that studio has seen kind of the thinking that led to the final creation. And so they have a much more textured, much more nuanced kind of understanding of that project, such that the teacher's comment or the, you know, the master's comments now kind of reflect back into all the processes, all the kind of steps that went into that particular final product. So it's a very rich type of experience for these kids to go through. Um, and it's also relatively cost effective because basically that one crit on that one student is a major learning event for everyone in the studio. And recursively, likewise, when you go around to crit each other's student, everyone else is overhearing and learning from that because they were kind of co-participants, you know, in some sense, in the, in the production of this final crit, this final project that's being criticized or critiqued, so to speak. Um, so I think that 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 whole sense of work in progress being rendered public, doing all this shoulder to shoulder, understanding kind of the social basis of learning that goes on, but also understanding that you're picking up a practice here. You're not just learning about being an architect. You're learning to be an architect. And so you're entering the practice through interesting pathways of accessibility. Um, but you are engaging fairly rapidly into the practices of architecture. And that idea of, again, learning to be much sooner in your career is a critical part of how um, these studios actually work. As you were speaking, it reminded me of the uh, AP history teacher who had small groups each um, answer different um, questions from the uh, AP exam that then right. were placed together in a wiki that then were evaluated together as a class as a whole. Does that sound like it's in some ways a, a parallel circumstance? Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's a, a, a major step forward. Um, you know, and it's also the case, although we can't afford it in all our schools, but if you look at how... Um, like history is taught at, at Exeter, a uh, school I happen to be looking at for a different reason. Um, you know, these 12 kids sit around this table, and they've all done all the reading before they walked in. And they sit around with the professor, uh, and they really argue out a particular stance of which historical interpretations they want to buy into for the stuff that they've been reading. 
And so, again, the, each one has to kind of construct an argument. They all hear each other's arguments. They all critique each other's arguments, as does the professor. And it becomes a very powerful, in-process learning environment, so to speak. I mean, you said, you know, you have put a beautiful spin on that, because now you, you're you rendering in public the arguments, which, of course, what the wiki is also doing. You're kind of getting other people's commentary on it as well, and so on and so forth. So I think the whole role of social software uh, in the classroom, um, you know, is, is, is a major step forward this way, not the least of which is, for example, if you're actually engaged in a class blog, all of a sudden you're learning how to write to your peers not your teacher. And there are certain games that you learn how to write to your teacher, which are really quite different than effective writing to your peers. And you, right away, you start to experience two different senses of being. Am I, you know, am I trying to be a writer for my teacher or for my peers? And what's the difference between those two? I'm particularly interested in educational blogging and, and do think that it uh, not just in the school environment, but I know that for myself, uh, b blogging does seem to transform many aspects of my life, even outside of the blogging, just because of the process of interaction and, and feeling that I'm engaged in something of significance. Yeah, and you and you're engaged with an audience. Um, uh, one of the stories that, that you tell is about um, moving to a studio environment and. Uh, I think it was at MIT, and how it just didn't feel like it was working until there was an opportunity to um, to rethink the role of the teacher. Right from from a lecturer to to what what's uh, sort of been the the meme that's been going around the blogosphere in the last couple of weeks is the tour guide, you know, the, or the coach, or you know, someone who facilitates the Socratic dialogue. So yeah, it seems that's a pretty significant part of the equation is to to have some kind of training. Well, I think it's first of all, please recognize that before any new technology um, has a chance to reach its real power in terms of changing learning, um, that technology is going to often involve teachers changing their own practice. Uh, and I think that what we saw beautifully in this design case of the, uh, the Teal work at, at MIT um, is that this whole shift to uh, design uh, studios for learning physics demanded that the professors move from being a sage on the stage, which they had perfected at MIT, uh, more or less, uh, to being this... Um, um, you know, I think it was a more of a mentor and a coach or a tour guide, but there's some really interesting skills. I've actually got to watch some of this actually unfold in terms of a very subtle balance between a small amount of recitation, ability to walk around the class, or the, or the design tables, see which tables are getting stuck, being able to figure out, by the way, ahead of time how to design who goes to what tables. And you notice one of the major things, I, I, depending which paper you read of mine, um, you, you will see that one of the shifts had to do with suddenly not marking, from this, let me say it differently, deciding not to mark the class on a curve. Because if you mark a class on a curve amongst really competitive students, which MIT certainly is, um, you will suddenly find that students are much less inclined to help each other unless they happen to be participants in the same study group. But once you tell the class that it's not going to be marked on a curve, then suddenly everybody wants to help each other because in helping each other you also learn things. I mean, just think about it. You know, one of the oldest sayings that any of us have been professors have ever kind of realized we started out on our career is you don't actually know something until you have to teach it. So actually, uh, the better student helping to explain something to another student actually learns something him or herself at the same time as the recipient of that learns. 
And so you get a very interesting learning dynamic and a social dynamic moving hand in hand here. When you say that, I'm immediately drawn back to um, some of the material that my wife and I covered when we uh, homeschooled one of our children. Uh, have you thought about um, that particular group, the homeschooling environment, and are there things that could potentially help to inform this discussion? Oh, I think that the impact of this technology for homeschooling is dramatic. Um, and I, mean, I think it can help homeschooling in so many different ways. It's incredible, and I think that homeschooling is one more example of what I call the edge that we can start to learn a lot more from in terms of what parts of this edge start to really work well that can eventually come back to inform the center. So I think uh, uh, homeschooling done for the right reasons is going to turn out to be a major source of, of insights for how we can start to eventually morph the core. And you know, as obvious as you know, that with homeschooling, with the social software uh, capabilities today, that your kid can actually become you know, a significant player in multiple communities of interest uh, that happen to be virtual communities uh, at the same time. So there's kind of a social basis of learning that comes back in with some of these capabilities of the um, Web 2.0. Fascinating. Uh, you talk a couple of times about visiting Korea and how they're about 10 years ahead of us, South Korea, in terms of broadband access. Have right. you noticed any changes in their educational institutions that are directly the result of that kind of access? Um, I have not um, seen how the um, K-12 through schools have changed because of this. Uh, what I've been looking at more is the social life of what kids do outside of school and what they do as they become professionals. Uh, instead of watching TV, how do they use the net to kind of improve their skills, find new things, and kind of engage in a form of continuous productive inquiry and almost a form of entertainment. Now, if I move over to Singapore, there you see a huge shift. And you see a huge shift there, but partly because the government has taken deadly seriously that knowledge work is the essence of the 21st century. And for that to be successful, for Singapore to be successful in knowledge work, they have to find some way to take on the notion of being innovative. And what they have been doing and making some amazing progress in the last couple of years is bringing into the school system something that could be called the full inquiry method where students starting at a very early age engage in deep inquiry into particular um, projects of their own making, often scaffolded by you know, the teacher. But there's a whole sense of kind of building you know, small groups of kids that go off and actually start to explore in a fair amount of depth something. Um, and I've seen that start to work, especially in the high-end schools, being Singapore, they actually start to experiment in places that have to work best and then start to map it through the entire school system. But to see schools that are based almost totally on the full inquiry method is pretty eye-opening. You tell a story about a team of, I think it uh, was a team of Xerox technicians. Right. And uh, trying to uh, capture the the exchange of knowledge. Are you willing to tell that briefly again? Sure. It's called the Eureka, and we actually did it back in the, uh, I hate to say it now, in probably the uh, mid to late 80s. And it may have been one of the first <coughs> examples of social software <coughs> and one of the few uh, really successful knowledge management projects even today. But the key here was to recognize that in Xerox we had 25,000 tech reps. Um, each one um, a part of a community of practice of tech reps in their particular locale. So we had, in some sense, a network of communities of practice. This network is strung out around the world. 
Uh, it turns out that Xerox copiers or copiers in general are fairly complicated devices that, depending on what environments they operate on, develop brand new types of faults that engineers have never seen before. You know, for, uh, because, for example, a copier depends on electrostatic fields, dot, 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 depending on the moisture or the particular world or the climate that you're in, these machines kind of age differently. So it became really interesting to recognize that these tech reps all around the world, every day, were discovering potentially very interesting things. The question is, how could they be captured? And how could you move from just an opinion to something that became warranted enough that other people in another part of the world would be able to act on reliably? Uh, to kind of create, you know, I'd almost call it a knowledge capture or knowledge refinement type process. And so we kind of invented this little scheme where the uh, a particular tech, tech rep would kind of come up with an idea, a hint, or you know, something that he or she discovered, would choose four or five other tech reps to vet that idea very rapidly, and then once it got vetted, that that new hint or idea or trick would be put onto the kind of knowledge web that we had created back in the 80s. Um, and the key part of it was that the name of the tech rep would be assigned, would be adjoined to that. And in some cases, the people vetting the idea, they contributed significantly to the refinement of that idea, their names would go on as well. And so that whole sense of being able to construct or to build an identity for myself by creating ideas that other people started to use around my own locale, ah, even around the entire world of the Xerox world, became an amazing kind of social phenomenon. And so that was kind of the beginning of this whole kind of um, notion of social capital and intellectual capital being formed, both being two sides of the same coin. What is that coin? It's the coin of creating meaning and identity for myself. That's still being used today now, uh, almost 20 years later. I guess what interested me as well about that story was the idea that you discovered that, that the most important exchange of information was taking place in a context that was not traditional information exchange, but was sort of socializing. Am I remembering that right? Yes, absolutely. It was in terms of little tiny stories that could be told and retold and retold. And often in a retelling, uh, retelling a story is a learning process for the person telling as well as it is for the person listening. Uh, and sometimes the stories would get refined uh, by other people telling the story and so on and so forth. So it was kind of a, an interesting social dynamic for the dissemination of knowledge as well. Now, it was completely contrary to the very formal training that they were actually getting, um, which is much more kind of rote procedures, fault isolation procedures they were being taught, and so on and so forth. This had to do with little stories. And then basically what we kind of discovered is that troubleshooting a complex machine, a complex fault on a complex machine, often involved kind of spinning a story that explained all the properties of that machine. And so the spinning of that story really had to do with weaving together fragments of other stories that they picked up through this process. It had nothing to do with the fault isolation procedures. And in fact, um, at one point for a bizarre set of reasons, Xerox decided to kind of try to stamp out the telling of stories. Uh, with this community. And what it meant is that they had to then send these kids back to Leesburg to be trained even more on these meaningless full isolation procedures. Um, and what happened when these kids came back from the training field? All they do is sit around telling stories at how little they learned <laughs> back at the formal training. Um, now, let me just add one aspect to this because as you see, being attuned to the social dynamics really matters here. Why is it that the tech reps didn't like to use the fault isolation procedures? Well, first of all, they're very hard to memorize. So why weren't they just using the fault isolation books that Xerox carefully provided these people? And one reason was you walk into a customer site and you're carrying a three-inch book uh, that tries to tell you how to do everything. Well, sitting there 
thumbing through this book makes you look like I wrote a tomaton in front of the customers that you're trying to serve. And these guys are actually social beings. And in fact, an awful lot of what they learn about how to fix a particular machine has to do with building a relationship with the people in that office who actually start to fill in what happened to the machine before they got the error code and so on and so forth. So these kids unconsciously were actually building deep social relationships with people in the office as ways to extract information that help them do their job better. And Xerox at the same time was saying walk in with this huge manual, already hard to carry, along with your other toolkit, and then page through this manual that made you look like you know, a, a rote automaton which actually destroys their ability to have credibility with the customer. So if you step back and see the broader context, you begin to see kind of how these social dynamics are playing out. Uh, and everything we were doing at the company level turned out to be against how to make this a natural learning, a natural problem solving, a natural innovating environment. I think what I like about that story is that there was the discovery that that, that learning was taking place in a different way than was thought. There was probably a little bit of groping at that point to figure out, you know, you know, what do we do, and maybe some mistakes. But ultimately, there was the ability to create a new system which actually captured and then enhanced that type of learning. But it took a huge amount of trust uh, on all kinds of people to actually come to that realization. I mean, obviously, it goes against the power structure. It goes against the sense of uh, management's simple notion of sitting around a coffee table or a water cooler telling stories is actually real knowledge of work. They should be out there, you know, studying things. Or they should be out there actually, you know, pouring over the machine. They shouldn't be sitting around, you know, drinking coffee together talking. And so there are a lot of things that have to change to recognize that informal work uh, or the, the the informality of kind of what you were doing either after work or in, during your breaks and things like this, if done right, become in fact very significant learning moments. Seems to me that that we may go through a very similar kind of a process as we think about education. I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, uh, in some sense, we're so used to measuring on-task stuff that we don't even begin to realize that most of what we do off-task may be more relevant than what we do on-task for the very things we're supposed to be doing. <laughs> John, you are really a, a prince for taking time uh, there in Hawaii to, to have this conversation. Is there anything we didn't talk about that, that, with regard to K-12 education that occurred to you that you would want to leave us with? I think the one thing that, that it's worth going back to very, very briefly um, is the sense that, uh, that I keep coming back to is that a huge amount of the learning that a lot of us did um, that kind of formed the foundations of all the formal education we got afterwards were things having to do with tinkering. And I remember I was, you know, a radio amateur at a very, very early age. I repaired, you know, motorcycle engines, uh, lawnmowers and motorcycles, cars, all this kind of stuff. That I grew up in a profoundly tinkering environment that I had to craft for myself. Curiously, my parents, both being academic, um, were convinced that all the time I spent in the garage tinkering with motors, engines, tinkering with radios, transmitters, was basically wasted the time. I should be focusing on academic work. But I came to realize, now having been in a half a dozen different fields, that my ability to pick up new stuff was incredibly enabled by the kind of skills I picked up as a tinkerer in terms of how to think about how to put stuff together, how to understand small s systems, how systems interlock with other systems, and so on and so forth. That kind of sense of tinkering formed the basis of being able to ground an astronomical amount of highly academic work later. Now, what happened is that around the mid-'80s, 
We created a culture. We created a set of technologies and products that basically made tinkering impossible. The radio, the automobile, became what I would call cognitively impenetrable. You'd throw it away or you'd have to take it to an expert. It's very hard to tinker with today's cars. And in fact, in California, it's actually against the law to tinker with cars uh, because basically tinkering today means going in and changing the software. And if you change the software, you can increase the power of cars a huge amount, but you also mess up emissions and all and cleanliness and all this kind of stuff, blah, blah, blah. So basically, a, a whole generation has grown up that were never tinkerers. But lo and behold, starting maybe 10 years ago, tinkering has come back in. But it's come back in a completely new way. It has come back in, in terms of these participatory architectures, where we can now tinker with all kinds of things on the web, from music to video to electronic circuits to uh, you name it. And today, there are ways to tinker. But there's something really interesting about this kind of tinkering. Yes, it is virtual. Yes, it is social. Yes, it has to do with virtual communities often. Um, and yes, there are certain support structures if you want to tinker with physical things um, that now happen. I'll tell you one on how to modify 911 Porsche engines, very active forum group on that. Um, but this new type of tinkering is relatively gender in, uh, non-specific. So an awful lot of the tinkering that laid the foundations for learning in the past actually privileged men. But today, that's going away. I think that you're going to find women tinkering as much uh, guys, uh, as guys do. And so what's very encouraging to me is I think by bringing back an awareness of the tinkering cultures and how they have now become you know, gender neutral, we may actually be at the first step toward actually building a new type of you know, scientific, a new type of kind of platform for really advancing math and science education and interests that cross-cut the genders. That's a great way to finish. Thanks, John. Right on.